to turn it over to Dan, but I'm also going to be passing out note cards so you guys can write down your questions. All right, good morning, everyone. Um, I actually do have slides, so let me put those up and get out of the way. Thank you. Do, do. Great. All right. Um, first of, can you all hear me? Yes. Great. Uh, first of all, I want to say congratulations. Um, math is a really beautiful subject. Uh, it provides a window into human thought, and it's a way, it's a new way of seeing the world, and going in on that journey is very exciting, and I'm very excited for your daughters. I think that's absolutely fantastic. Um, what I want to do is provide some thoughts on what comes next. Um, I've spent, you know, I've spent my career doing math education for students who are very interested in math, I think much like Zooming. And actually my message is going to be quite similar in many ways. Um, but I want to provide a little bit of perspective and thoughts on what opportunities come next, how you follow up on those opportunities. And my thoughts come from years of working at Canada USA Math Camp and also with a program I run now uh, starting at a younger age for students in New York City. It's specifically for low income students, uh, for students of color, talking about creating a mathematical pathway. And so I've been thinking a great deal recently about what does that pathway look like and how do you best encourage students and help them through that process? And that's something I'm hoping to talk about. These are the students, but I'm going to skip that one. Okay, so um, I wanna talk a little bit about questions that I often get from parents. So one question I often get is, how can my child get into a great college? And I think that this is sort of the wrong question. Uh, don't get me wrong, I'm entirely supportive of students going to MIT or Harvard if they really have to. <laughs> old, old, old rivalries die hard. Um, but I think somehow this is the wrong question because this isn't actually what you want. Similarly, how much is enough? How many things do I have to do? How long does my resume have to be? How many hours do I have to spend volunteering? And how many clubs do I have to be president of? And, and so on and so forth. And these really are the wrong questions. And they're not actually what you're interested in. What you are interested in is how can I raise someone who will be happy, well-adjusted, and make the most of their life, make the most of their abilities, make the most of what they can get to. That's what you're actually interested in. And like Zooming said, you want to play the long game. You want to think about how you're getting them there. And you don't want to be thinking about how can I meet some checklist that a college admissions officer is going to look at because they're not actually looking at a checklist. That's not how they do it. What they want to see is a story about a student who's passionate about what they're doing developing. And so you want to take your student and you want to bring forth their passions you don't want to tick things off a box and then hope that you know, in the roulette game you happen to get selected because you are one of the many people who ticked things off a box instead of exploring what they were actually interested in. Um, great. So a lot of times, and this is, this is one of those things that depends on the audience. You are already people who seek out a lot of enrichment opportunities. But when I'm talking to a lot of students at my other program, at, at this program for underserved students, those are families that are not plugged into these opportunities. They've never heard of Math Prize for Girls. They've never heard of the AMC. Uh, they've never heard of Math Counts. They've never heard of any of this. And so for them, a lot of times what I have to say is, you know, you think of education as a line. You think you go to, from first grade to second grade to third grade to fourth grade all the way up. And then it's just, you know, you pass one grade, you go on to the next, and if you get good grades, you're done. And that's not actually true. Um, that's not really how it works. And in part, that's because at most schools, the math curriculum, for example, is not actually very good. Um, but also because there are all of these other opportunities to explore. There's a whole ecosystem of different opportunities that you can be a part of. And it could be math contests. It could be robotics contests. It could be you know, a science olympiad. It could be all of these different things you can do, computer programming, independent reading, whatever you want. Um, and so the question really is, how do you develop yourself within this ecosystem of opportunities? What do you choose to do? Um, they are important, um, 
but it can also end up feeling a little bit like an arms race. Right, like to make a mistake, it can feel like an arms race, the tuba to the bassoon to the whatever. Like it, feel, it feels like you're racing for this thing. Um, I think we achieve based on what we love and what we choose for ourselves. Uh, and so I want to think about changing from the arms race perspective, from the perspective of how can I tick off all these things, to the perspective of looking for what you're passionate about and finding it within all of these different opportunities, but also actually seeking it out, not being satisfied with what's in school. And you're already not satisfied just with that track. You're already looking for more. So here are questions I ask myself. I ask myself, how can I help my students realize their potential? Um, I ask myself, how can I encourage students to push themselves without taking away their initiative? It's very important to me that when my students grow up, they want to keep pursuing this because they're not going to have me over their shoulder forever telling them to do things. And so I need them to develop that from within. So I'm asking them, how can I encourage them? How can I enable them to push themselves on their own in the future? Um, and how can I help students find what they love and follow it? How can I encourage them and yet not make that encouragement something that forces them to engage in something they actually don't want to do? How can I help them to track their own interests and what they're actually interested in doing? So um, I have, over the years, developed five, I think, primary ideas that I want to share with you. They're going to include you know, a little bit of specifics, but also just general things to think about. One of those things is to create opportunities and encourage passions. What does that mean? It means understanding what students love and providing avenues for it. It means actually talking to the students, seeing what they're interested in. And then, you know, students, teenagers don't often think that far ahead about what they're doing. Um, so you can be on the lookout for something, you know, if your daughter is interested in robotics, then you can keep an eye out for opportunities in robotics, for example. You can Google robotics programs online, and you will find many of them uh, in virtually any topic, not just robotics, in virtually anything you look for. If you look for it online, you will find something. You still have to decide which of them are actually good, um, but you can find them all there. Um, talking with them about the direction, I think I already mentioned that. Um, and I like to start dialogues with students. If I know that a student of mine is interested in something and I run across an article in a magazine somewhere, or, you know, in, or if I see a video online, I will send that student that video. Um, I, will, I will say, hey, aren't you interested in this? And we'll start a conversation. And you can do that, too. And it's a great way to start conversations with your daughter. And it's a great way to keep up their interest and also to get a better sense of what they're really interested in. My second suggestion is to be attentive to details. And this is something I think is really easy to miss. Um, so one of the, Zooming touched on this a lot, one of the discussions that's going on a lot right now in the math community is this question of math competitions. Uh, what does that competitive atmosphere do for the students who don't do well? And one of the things that's really important that, that Zooming talked about is it's fine to not do well at the competition so long as you have the right mindset going into that. But that means you have to cultivate that mindset in, this, in, in your students when they go. You don't want them to think that mathematics has a linear ranking, because it doesn't. There's no best mathematician and worst mathematician and everyone else ordered in between. That's not how it works. In fact, competitions don't look at a lot of the things that are important for mathematicians. You know, if, you, if you're going to go on and get a PhD in mathematics, you're going to spend three years, four years, five years working on a single math problem, not a minute and a half. So, so they, they're not modeling the whole mathematical process. There's no ordering of mathematicians in the way that contests sometimes subtly imply to people. And so preparing students for that, but also thinking about your daughter, about how it, does she come away from the competition feeling energized, or does she come away from it feeling deflated? And to some extent, you can work on um, building her view of her own growth through the competition. But what you can also do is look for competitions that don't have that sort of linear ranking. And I'll mention a little bit about that in a moment. 
Um, also timed versus untimed. You know, mathematics is not something where you have to do things very quickly. It's not, it's not actually something that relies on that speed. Speeded calculation is very helpful for mathematicians in a lot of cases. They do want to be able to see things quickly. But competitions encourage that a little bit more than actually happens in the real world. Uh, and so if your daughter is not happy about timed contests, that's fine. And there are other things you can look for. These are the details that you can tweak when you're looking for the right opportunities. Another is individual versus team. Girls like working together a lot. Um, I think boys like working together too. Uh, but this is something where you can look for individual contests, for team contests. They come in different formats. If you go to Armel, then at Armel there's both an individual and a team component. Uh, and I love the team components at Armel because you have like the, the power questions where you're actually writing proofs. Like those are absolutely delightful. Um, so finding, finding that mix can be very valuable. Um, so just to give you an example, here are three contests that I happen to be familiar with that tweak these variables in ways you might not be familiar with. One is the USA Mathematical Talent Search. Uh, the, keep in mind, I'm biased here because now I'm running it, although I'm sort of running it by accident. But um, So the USA Mathematical Talent Search, you get five proof-based problems. You get a month to work on them. Uh, so the timed component is now gone. You have a month for five problems. Now, they're difficult problems. Uh, and then there are three rounds of that. And then at the end, there's no ranking. There are top scores by score, but there are several people who get the very top score. People's discussions in it are centered around doing better than they did before, rather than around you know, being the top scorer. Um, so that's an example of something that tweaks the competition atmosphere and the timed versus untimed, but it's individual. The Purple Comet Math Meet, which is run online, uh, is timed. Um, and, but uh, the, the competition is less emphasized because you do it on your own, and it's a team contest. It's entirely a team contest uh, that you do at your school or as part of a math club or whatever. So that's an option to do just a team contest. Um, the high school mathematical contest in modeling is one that I think these circles often don't know about and I think is absolutely delightful. First of all, it's applied math. Um, the sort of question they might ask you is come up with an evacuation plan uh, for the state of South Carolina in the event of a hurricane. That's the question. That's it. Uh, and then you get 24 hours, or it might be up to 36 hours now. I don't know. Um, they don't really encourage sleep during that time. That's unfortunate. Um, but you get that amount of time to answer that question and to write a paper. And that paper is then sent to the judges. And then the judges, you know, it could be outstanding, it could be excellent, it could be meritorious, or I think like honorable mention or something like that. So there's no best, second best, third best linear ranking. So it, it takes away the competition atmosphere. It's a team-based contest. And um, it's applied math. It's different. It feels like something else. So for, for people who really want to see how math is used in the world, this is an excellent way to introduce them to that. Uh, so that's just some examples of different ways to tweak the details to make what your daughter is doing the best fit for her. Um, and again, recognizing that, that excellence comes in many ways, um, that there's no linear ordering of mathematicians, and that we do this for the joy of it and for the challenge of it. Uh, and I think that's a really important thing to emphasize to young mathematicians. The next, in my sort of suggested tips, is to seek out serious learning. And this is probably something you're already doing, but basically what I want to say is that programs differ in terms of their rigor and in terms of how serious the, the mathematics is. So first of all, there are lots of great opportunities to explore. Um, there's a program called Splash at many universities. Uh, there are numerous local programs you can do. There are a lot of online articles, videos, podcasts, et cetera. And these are great, great opportunities. Um, there are also opportunities for genuine advanced learning. Uh, there are summer programs, uh, especially if you find the high quality summer programs. There are math circles around the country that often do great math. You can find them at mathcircles.org. They're like everywhere. Um, Art of Problem Solving, I think, is a great site. Um, edX, Coursera, et cetera, let you access college courses online to look at. Um, 
One thing that I think you want to be careful, though, as you're doing this, is that some programs will bill themselves as being for serious learning, and they're not. You know, it's, it's a program that says, like, we're a program for future engineers, and you spend your time building bridges out of spaghetti. That's a wonderful way to get an initial interest in a subject, but that is not an accurate representation of what engineering is like at all. And so you do actually want to be careful, and you want to talk to people who know about which of these programs are high quality. People you know could be um, you know, mathematicians you know, or people involved in the education community, your math coach, or whatever. Um, or it could be the friends that your daughter just made here at MathPrize. Right? Because they will have gone to other programs, and they can recommend the ones where they actually learned a lot. Great. Um, next thing that I think about is developing self-identity for students. So thinking I am a mathematician gives you power. And what I mean by this is growing up, I had setbacks, but I also said, I'm a mathematician. I am someone who likes math, who is good at math. And so when I had a setback, I knew that I would overcome it. I said, yes, I didn't do so well on this test, or yes, I didn't do so well on whatever, but I'm a mathematician. I will be able to get over this. And that provided a kind of shield that protected me from any messages I got that were negative, because I had that self-identity. Growing that self-identity helps to protect you as you go forward and you experience setbacks. There are a lot of people who stop doing mathematics, stop looking for serious work because they've felt too challenged, they've gotten these negative messages, and they've let them overwhelm that, them. But if you really develop that identity as a mathematician, as a scientist, as whatever it is you want to do, then you will be able to, to say, that was a blip. I'm actually still very good at this, and I'm going to keep going in that direction. And so I think that self-identity is very, very important for students. Um, intellectual communities and friendships are absolutely essential. Uh, being around other people who are very interested in what you're interested in drives you forward as an academic because you want to achieve like your friends are doing. Uh, you see what they're doing, how much they're working, and you are driven to work as well. So seeking out those communities um, is just an incredibly powerful thing to do. And it could be clubs within schools. It could be math circles. It could be summer programs. Um, all of these develop community. And this is why Math Prize, for example, has a board games night. You know, the night before, because it's developing that community. It's creating those connections that will help drive the students here further afterwards. Um, being around people who work hard, same as the communities, and being attentive to women in science and mathematics. Um, you know, this is, this is a serious issue. Women are underrepresented right now in science and math. Uh, there are a lot of signals that sometimes come up that discourage them from proceeding. It depends on the environment you grew up in, but this is definitely something that your daughters can talk about facing. Um, and just being attentive to that, making sure that they have role models, that they see that there can be a really welcoming future for them. Um, actually, um, uh, Ranu and Ravi's daughter, Mina, uh, wrote a great article about this. And what I think is particularly great about this article is that it's from the perspective of someone who just recently went through this mathematical pathway in high school. And it really talks very directly about the community and the different things the community is into and how she adjusted to what that was and kept her self-identity. Uh, so um, this is great. You can Google it. It's a great article. So um, one more suggested idea, which is making sure students follow through. Um, so this is defining the structure for them to be successful, right? Especially when they're younger, thinking about when is it that they do homework? How do you know that they're going to get everything done? And in particular, thinking about having them decide what their goals are, and then when they're getting distracted, when they're thinking about other things, reminding them, oh, in order to achieve this goal you had for yourself, you should do this. Coming up with that structure collaboratively so they don't feel like it's forced down upon them, but also creating that structure that enables them to be successful and to reach their goals, because that is what they want to do. 
Um, so helping students make good on their intentions, again. And I will say that these sorts of things are, you know, in this program that I do for low-income students, this is something that has to come up a lot. Because again, it's something where they might not have the environment at home that sets these structures for them. So for us to work through with the students and then determine these are the things you really need to do and reminding them about those deadlines and what time they said they'd put into things is just a very valuable thing for them. Um, and I do want to say, like, what's needed really does depend on the student. Uh, different students are going to need different amounts of guidance. Some are just going to get so obsessed with what they're working on that they're going to dive in and keep going with it, and that's fantastic, and you should let them go because that passion is going to drive them to great success. Some of them are going to really want to do something, and they're going to show a lot of impulse for it. They're going to say, I want to achieve at this level, but they're not necessarily, um, but they're not necessarily going to naturally have the time management skills and the maturity to set their schedule to achieve what they want. And that's when they really need that reminder and that push. So to sum up, math is beautiful, it's fun, it's a life changer to have a part of, of what you do. Uh, with support and guidance, I think your daughters will be really successful. I hope that this was helpful. Thank you, Dan. So I'd like to invite Zhu Ming and Dan to come back uh, to the DS here. And I'd like to open up the uh, question and answer portion of the program. Um, I'm going to be reading some of the questions that you all have. But uh, please also feel free, if you'd like to ask your question directly, to come on down to the microphone over there so that you can ask your question yourself. OK? Um, First, we have uh, just an expression of thank you. Uh, great topic. I learned a lot as a parent. Um, OK. Um, now, here's a, here's a question. It says, what can be the biggest challenge to transition from a high school math lead to a math major in college? And before you answer that, I just would like to, to add um, that there's a lot of evidence now that um, Success as a mathlete um, actually predicts success in every area. Um, so if you are good at math at an early age, um, yeah, you know, <laughs> absolutely. Um, you're not necessarily going to become a mathematician, but you can become a great scientist. You can become a great doctor. You can become a great lawyer. You can become a great social scientist. You can even become a great artist or painter. Um, so I think that math um, at an early age uh, is very accessible. Uh, it really teaches key problem-solving skills um, that I think are useful no matter what uh, area your daughter um, chooses to pursue. But uh, let's just have you guys answer that question. Go ahead. Uh, sure. So um, I think the biggest transition is going from um, depending on what level the students were at, is going from time, academically, it's going from timed questions to homework where you have a lot of time to think about it. Um, and depending on how much proof based work the student did, um, you know, mathematics in college is about doing proofs. And so that comes up on USIMO, it comes up on the USAMTS. Uh, but it doesn't come up in most other contests because the graders don't have time to grade proofs and to do that consistently. So academically, I think those are the biggest challenges that, that come up. Um, certainly, like all of the usual social adjustment and so on is, is also a factor. Yeah, I agree with many of the information you said. Um, I want to add a little bit more about this is um, First of all, they should be very humble to each subject because no matter how good their high school math or not, not even limit to high school, you say, for example, your international math Olympia gold medalist, many of them after one year or after one month, they came back, they said, well, now I know how much math actually I do not know. Or put it this way, actually, they don't know any math. The reason is very simple. 
if you go to the math department here in the wonderful school of MIT or the other school down the road. <laughs> <laughs> I think even for the most advanced IMO gold medalist, if they go to a Wednesday seminar talk, the only thing they can enjoy is the cookie and the tea. <laughs> <laughs> It basically takes them about five years, which is why there's a four years of college and one year of graduate school to even understand that, that problem is interesting, uh -huh. right? So that part, they have to be very humble to understand where they are. On the other hand, they should be very confident is they don't need to get this very quickly. So that's, again, the information, go back to what I said earlier, is really time is your friend. You don't think you can do these things in one year because every mathematician sitting in this department are as smart as they are or even better when they were that age anyway. And they spend another 20 or 25 years thinking about this seven days a week and 24 hours a day, right? So there's a difference. And then finally is, Yes, I completely agree. Math could be indicating you can be successful in many, many areas, but you still should re completely respect each one of those areas. They have their way of discipline, how to develop. Okay. This is how you see a mathematician sometimes cannot even move a, a machine, right? Because they might not be good at those, right? So, you know, many times people say, if you are good in math, you must be good in physics. I don't think that's true at all. Right? You, you, you can be good at math, but you still have to have many, many hours to really understand the, the real concepts of the way of thinking in physics to really adapt to it, right? So, so when they were young, developing great study skills are extremely helpful because then they can apply their study skills to learn something that they are not familiar with, mm -hmm. and then they can be successful, right? So that's the adjustments. <clears throat> I actually wanted to add one more thought that yeah. came up, which I think is um, um, a little bit less sort of uh, visionary overall than what Zuming is saying. But another thing that happens in, uh, in contest math at the highest levels is that you start to realize that a lot of contest problems tend to be fairly repetitive. There are styles of contest problems that tend to recur, and it's like, okay, now this is an inequalities problem where I'm going to use Cauchy-Schwartz in some way, and then you move on. It, it, it's sort of that feeling to it. And that's no longer true in the same way when you're learning new material and when you have to apply things in different ways. So there's a, a sort of transition that has to happen for students where they change how they're thinking about mathematics a little bit as they go on. Uh, and so that's, that's another thing where if they expect it to be similar to what they had before, they're, they're going, they, they want to be ready for something quite different. Yeah, and the following along that way is one dangerous track is this. Because you learned quite well in high school, or even in continuing on physics and the math mm -hmm. Olympiads or robotics, in the first three weeks of your college course, mm -hmm. you feel like, man, I know this. I zoom in. You know, I can go play games at my home. Yeah. And then suddenly you realize two months later you don't know anything anymore. <laughs> because in a certain way, is all these uh, great high school courses, no matter which high school you go to, they will tell you, we have all these great courses. At the end, all these courses compared to the real courses, yeah. it's just a very baby first part. If you feel like those three months you are okay, then it's very dangerous. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> okay. Um, all right. So we have another question here, um, actually asking about um, you know some of the tension between following you know what you are recommending, you know, allowing a little space for. Uh, for our girls to reflect and follow their passions and really checking off all of these boxes, um, you know, for the, for college um, and, and filling out all of those um, evaluations. Do you have any advice on how to, you know, how to, how to help kids who are trying to walk that line and who might be overworked or sleep deprived? Well, uh for the past few years, I work at our high school admission office, too. I can tell you as a, a own reader, just like he just said, we do not what? Looking at all those check boxes. Mm -hmm. If you give me a, a deck of your 
resume about your achievements, my first feeling is, why do you waste time on that? You know, how long does it take you to do these things? Two hours, 20 hours? Or you have to hire an agent for you to do this, to pack you well, <laughs> right? Yeah. I, I, it's really not about that. It's really about reading the complete story, your teacher's recommendation, how they say you can contribute to your program in a positive way, right? So I feel like those are the things really is, this is what I said, if you go to the WeChat group or you know, whatever group, it's actually very a lot of negative information they will give it to you. Make you very nervous, seems like you, can, you need to do all these 20 things to get in. Because many times parents ask me, if my kid doesn't get into USJMO, can they ever get into MIT? I say, OK, let's do a simple, <laughs> let's do a simple computation, OK? <laughs> MIT have been how many students every year? 1,500? Mm -hmm. OK, 1,600. How many people really ever qualified for mass price for girls? How many today? Uh, two, three, 270. 270. How many of them are seniors? I don't know. Right? So if you make that calculation, suddenly you realize, man, I don't need to make to the girls mass prize to get into MIT because they admit many, many more students. That's clearly not one of the things they have to say you have to do. Right? So just relax. I feel like if, if you can tell the, the interviewer, the school, you are a fun person to work with, you have interesting ideas, you bring positive energies, you, it's much better than you have to do all the busy work. That's how I see it. Right? Yeah. yeah. They, they want the story of someone who uh, seeks out challenges and uh, is successful not the story of someone who volunteered because they needed the hours. Great. Um, I think we have a question over there. Well, sorry. He talked about the give children a time to relax. And I'm just wondering, I have a boy who likes to play a lot of games. Does playing computer games considered to be relaxed? And uh, what's the <laughs> <laughs> Well, Then you want to give a crack? <laughs> <clears throat> this is a hard one, and this comes up a lot. Um, you know, I mean, I don't think computer games are bad. I think, like anything, they need to be done in moderation. Uh, there are definitely, I grew up playing quite a few computer games, and I think I benefited from it in many ways. Um, but I'm also glad that I didn't spend my entire time in front of a computer, but that I moderated it somewhat. Um, but I definitely, you know, I mean, computer games require a fair amount of thinking. Excuse me. Do you mind you the question? Sorry. I'm sorry. Um, the question was essentially that um, uh, you have a, a, a son who plays a lot of computer games. And uh, how, does that, how, how does that tie into time to reflect and, and so on, you know, that, that time to explore? And so I think my answer is, in moderation, it's not something to be worried about. And you just want to make sure that it's not really excessive. Because it is something valuable to do, uh, to develop strategic thinking, and uh, just to unwind a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. So the time you put into that is very important, mm -hmm. right? Like Dan said, you, everybody play a few hands off whatever computer games, on a long flight from West Coast to here, maybe on the airplane, you play a few, right? So I, I feel you know, that's OK. But, uh, but it's the maturity. It's the self-discipline is very important, right? I think if they really plays a lot of every, every day, then you start to really have to be worried. Yeah. And I think it's, you know, your point earlier about motivation is really key. You know, it's really about helping him find his source of motivation. Um, and I think, you know, for your daughters who are here, uh, my guess is that they're all incredibly motivated and hardworking, and it's really about, um, you know, preserving that. Um, which brings me to the next question here. Um, do, you got, do you have any thoughts on how girls uh, and boys might be different um, in terms of their learning or their approach? to this? I, I can dive in very quickly, which is just to say that um, while there might be broad trends that can be observed, uh, I don't 
I feel like everyone's an individual, and so it's very dangerous to say, my daughter's a girl, and therefore she should do things this way. My son's a boy, and therefore he should do things this way. So I'm sort of reluctant to even go near the question. Um, I will say that you know my talking about the nature of competitions is something I brought up a little bit, because that's something I've heard specifically women in mathematics discuss as they might have gotten discouraged. That might have added to the signals they had that they were not right for mathematics. And so that's why I brought up uh, the appropriateness of competition specifically as something to think about with respect to what competitions your daughter is doing and how they go about it. If I might speak to that just a little bit, I, I'm not sure that this is ex your exact question. I mean, uh, we've had Glenn Ellison on this panel here in the past. He's an economist here at MIT who's looked at, um, you know, uh, some of some of the differences uh, between success, especially in these higher level competitions between girls and boys. So if you look at um, math achievement, uh, before high school, girls tend to uh, do as well or better than boys. Uh, but when we get to these higher level competitions, we find that there's an incredible drop off uh, in the number of girls um, you know, who uh, we find. Um, and there's many different theories about that. Um, and um, you know, a lot of people think that it has to do with the culture. Um, so I think that, um, you know, girls, our girls have an additional hurdle, which is, um, you know, that they may be in a minority, that they have to face this, this uh, you know, cultural bias, um, and that they also might be a little more sensitive to, um, you know, the opinions of others. So it takes a certain amount of... Uh, you know, grit and determination and uh, confidence and uh, belief that uh, it doesn't matter what other people think. And so, you know, I think with our girls, we have to, you know, particularly help them with that piece. Um, that's my opinion anyway. But, um, yeah, something, um, you know, that's evolving. And uh, the different format of contest, they might adapt in a different way. Um, my feeling is uh, if you work with girls or boys in classroom as individuals, the difference is, is almost very little, mm -hmm. minimum you can see. Uh, I, I don't see anything, if there's any, I do not aware of in class. On a contest, I would say this, maybe speed hurts a little bit. That's my feeling, the speed does hurt a little bit. Um, so that's why you can see on the speed exams, like AMC 12, it start to show a little bit. But I don't think, like Dan said in his um, earlier talk, in a certain way, I don't even think that those speed contests is a good contest, mm -hmm. right? So, so that might explore something completely unnecessary, right? But I, th I think... Um, in many t contests that involves more teamwork or whatever things, they can adapt much better. Yeah, right. yeah. I also want to add one more thing in response to the, the follow-up, which was about a study of different learning curves for boys and girls and having to learn the same amount before puberty. Uh, one thing that I want to caution you about is that social science studies come out like all the time, and there are serious questions of replicability, and there are serious questions of publication bias. Um, they can, you know, initially look very convincing, and then 20 years later, sort of people have forgotten about it because it didn't turn out to actually be true or relevant. I'm not saying that about this study necessarily, but what I'm saying is that you should very rarely judge what you should do based on one study, especially because this is. This is a field where a lot changes very quickly as things go on. And so what I would suggest is that you treat each student as themselves, and you push them, and you make sure they're challenged, and you don't worry too much about some 
metric about where they should be imposed by, by a study. Um, okay, so we have some questions over there. Um, alluding, to Glenn Get Ellison, sorry. <laughs> alluding to Glenn Ellison noting that women are highly underrepresented at the top levels, whether mass, mass counts or at the national level or, or the top 12 or USAMO or IMO, um, and things changing over time. You know, I know that a lot of women or young women are discouraged at times when they look at the few number of the small number of women performing at the top and have some inner doubts. I also know that a lot of Asians recently are really encouraged looking at the large number, overwhelmingly large number of Asians performing well. But if we look back like 20 or 40 years, it wasn't this way. Um, what do you think girls can learn about, and this also relates to how um, Mr. Zaharopoul is talking about things changing over time, and you're not a study, but just, you know, who's doing how well. What can girls learn about things changing over time? What possibilities can they see for themselves, not being tied up in how women are doing in contests now, and keeping an open mind about how it might be in 20 or 40 years? And what can they learn from how Asian, the Asian community got there? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I'm not sure that I can answer that, but, um, but I have to say that one of the great things is that, um, you know, uh, so much changes uh, quickly. We have a new crop of girls who come in every year, and uh, many times they're looking to, you know, the girls that are five and, five and six and seven years ahead of them, and, and it's been very exciting to see uh, you know, them encourage each other and create this network. Now, um, Zooming, is it true that you had two girls this year on the um, IMO team? And uh, is that a change? No, I think it's two girls, be uh, for the first time, become uh, two of the girls are the USMO winners. Mm -hmm. OK. Right. And um, can you just comment on that and whether, you know, um, how many girls you've seen at that level? Um, well, the data is um, somewhat a little bit discouraging. We, you, we wish have to more a balance out there. Um, but I think this is more of a slow process. You know, we have to break the barrier much, much, you know, slowly. It's not a quick thing because you need a bunch of foundations, what I think is the grassroots. Uh, this almost relate to um, your other question about why the, in a certain way you see more Asian people on the USMO qualifying list or whatever. Well, if you look at the US baseball qualifying list, it will be opposite, right? <laughs> so I, I think in a certain way this is a grassroots issue. Uh, it's more about um, more people doing it in a younger age, uh, for the good or for the bad, I'm not sure. Right, but then you see because of more people, you got a higher base, and then you have more people to do that, and that's why I think the activity like uh, MPG is great is to tell, you know, encourage the girl students, female students, they can do this, and they can do this very well. It's like uh, in the Mass Olympia program, we we'll invite more girls and to, to get them, you know, help them to develop, right? Give them more opportunities. That they should, that, that that they deserve, and now after five years we see the results, yeah. and then we see now we have two instead of maybe, you know, every one so five years we have one, right? But that's a slow process. That doesn't mean next year we will still have two, or the five years from now we have three. It's going back and forth, and then that's the whole process we are trying to do. Yeah. And if I could just paraphrase Glenn Ellison's work, uh, what he found was that. Um, of the, the um, high-level mathletes uh, around the country, the, he found, what he found was that the boys could come from anywhere, mm -hmm. uh, but that the girls tended to come either from families that had um, a uh, father or brother that was a mathematician or a mathlete, or from particular schools that had really good cultures um, that encouraged girls to go into math. 
Um, so, you know, hopefully we're going to begin to see that trend changing, and I would love to see somebody get involved in analyzing that data to see what's happening now. Uh, it is happening far too slowly, but hopefully your girls are, are going to be, you know, at the forefront of that, of that change. And, and specifically for talking to girls about this, it's getting better. I think that's clear from looking at it. It's no longer that you sort of have to be the pioneer who's, who's doing this. And there are communities of girls and women in mathematics that are very supportive. Um, so um, I think just, just the fact that the trend is getting better can help a lot in terms of talking to them. Yeah. And this trend is not really, uh, my feeling is this trend needs a generation of work. Mm -hmm. The feeling is, look, if we have so many girls are into this, if you compare to 40 years ago, that might not be the case. And these girls, when they grow up, they might become teachers, they might become professors, I mean, they might run uh, all kinds of programs like AOP or whatever, but that will be the, the change. Because then in the school, you, f you start to feel like I have a female coach you know, uh, that I can tie with. For example, the European um, Mass Olympiads, they specifically require the two coaches has to be female. I think that changed the whole culture a lot, right? Because, you know, the, this is politically could be wrong, but I still go to Armo or whatever, you look around, all the coaches are guys. Mm -hmm. And that's not cool. <laughs> right? And that's the problem. Well, I'm not saying all the coaches, but the percentage is still way, way dis unbalanced. But I hope after this 20 or years of work, and then we have more of those, then there's a difference. Yeah. And then I, that will bring the difference yeah. in the high school. And hopefully you'll also encourage your daughters to get involved and to volunteer and to mentor. Yes. Uh, yeah. You know, one of the best ways actually to improve yourself is to teach. Okay. You know, to improve your learning on a subject is to teach it. Uh, and if we have more girls get involved, you know, I certainly saw this at my daughter's school. Uh, there was a whole slew of girls that, that got involved, you know, behind her. Um, so I think that, you know, just a couple of people can make a huge difference. Um, and when we, you know, first started with this competition seven years ago, everybody asked, well, why are you, why do you need this special contest for girls? You know, isn't this discriminatory? Um, there was a lot of pushback. And, um, you know, I think that um, some, of the, some of the people that were a little skeptical at first changed their minds when they came and they saw how different, you know, the environment was um, at the competition. So, um, you know, hopefully um, it's beginning to change, um, but it does take time. All right, I think we're out of time. Thank you very much. And uh, I think you're really gonna enjoy the program uh, this afternoon. <laughs>